<clears throat> All right, hi everyone. Welcome to um, the inclusive teaching workshop on the stigmatized impulsive feeling in your classroom, um, how to take risks and fail productively. Um, my name is Lynn Nguyen, my pronouns are she, her, and I am an inclusive teaching coordinator at the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. Um, although I am brand new to the professional and educational development field, I started the job this last year, last June, um, but I have over a decade of teaching experience in higher education um, at NIU and at um, other institution. So welcome. Um, so first thing first, we still have um, we have four more people who register for this workshop and they're not here yet. So I want to take a few minutes to get to know you um, and find out how diverse we are in terms of our discipline um, and expertise. So uh, there's two ways you could, um, well, them three ways you could join. I just want you to share with the group here your name um, and your pronouns if you have one and if you are comfortable sharing. Um, the next thing I want you to share is your field of study. And then the last thing is just a little bit about you outside of the um, expertise and discipline context. So what do you do when you're not working? So maybe share some of your hobbies or side hustle. Um, and I budget a few minutes to do this. So um, you have option. You could scan the QR code to join on Padlet. I will drop the link to the Padlet in the chat box. And or you can just unmute yourself and share here. So and a couple of minutes, I will move the share screen to um, to Padlet so we can see who we got here. Katie, art education. You have twin daughter. I have um uh, an eight years old and a five years old. They are a lot of fun. Tracy Jones, educational leadership, home improvement project. <laughs> um, I think Tracy, uh your message might have come directly to me and not to everyone. Um, so you might want to copy and paste again. All right, so uh, let's see. So we're doing introduction right now and I know some of you join us a little later. So uh, let me just get rid of this. So three simple question and you have a uh, sample post here. So what your discipline, your name, your pronouns, if you have one and comfortable sharing, and then uh, your hobby, or what are you doing when you're not working? So let's see, K, English, um, GTA in English department. When you're not working, you are traveling, reading. Great. So we have Professional development, educate art education, English.
right i will bring us back to this in a little while now let's get back to the presentation okay i see we're gonna go back to that introduction in a little bit let's give you some time to participate so um just really quick here are our agenda for today or the learning objective for today um i'm really excited to have um a quite diverse group of participants um here with me today so we will explore some of the concept on identities intersectionality privilege and the relationship of these um, identity intersectionality to imposter syndrome. And then next, we will discuss strategies to destigmatize impulsive feeling, including um, reframing mistake as part of learning. So, and we will also discuss how mistake can be both harmful and helpful depending on how we view them. And from this discussion, we will identify opportunities that come from mistake. Um, and the last thing that I want us to do together is to uh, identify some strategy that for dealing with impulsive feelings and channeling a healthy dose of self-doubt into productivity. So um, these strategy, I have been practicing some of these strategy to overcome impulsive feeling myself. Um, many of these strategy are evidence-based psychological research strategies. Some are from my own lived experiences and some of these strategy may work for you or your student, some may not. But after today, I hope that you will have a better understanding of what a imposter phenomenon um, and, and you can develop strategy that help your student success. So, um, <clears throat> identity. So, let's see. Um, we cannot exist alone, right? We exist in relation to one another. And the term social identity is one of the ways of naming the complex interaction between how we understand ourselves and how others see us with respect to major social categories. So the identity is socially constructed and it can be apparent to others, sometimes it's not. Um, Sometimes the identity is shared with others or kept private. Some are self-claim and um, some are ascribed by others. So for example, I identify myself as a person of color, a woman, a non-native English speaker. Um, so these are visible to anyone. Like when you hear me speak English, you know that uh, I'm not a non-native English speaker because of my accent. So we typically focus on the visible social identity and less so on the invisible relational or professional identity. So for example, I am also an immigrant. I am a first generation college graduate. Uh, I'm a wife, a mother, a woman in STEM. So those things I, I self-claim and I have to share with you. Otherwise you wouldn't know if you just look at me, right? Um, so my social identity um, inform and instruct the way I see the world, the way I teach, the way I learn, um, the way I lead in community. And that's why I want to define these concepts um, of identity and how these identity affect the way individual, in this case, you or your student may experience uh, the world, including the imposter phenomenal, imposter feeling. So you, if your identity is constantly viewed as less capable in a certain setting, it can make you feel 
by a fraud, like an imposter, despite all the achievement that, that you have. Um, another important concept that I want to share here is um, privilege. So privilege is a group of unearned rights extended to a group based on their social identity. So for example, as a person of color, I may have less privilege than a white person in America. However, as an able-bodied person and a neurotypical person, I have more privilege than someone with disability or, or neurodiversity. So I put here an image that I took from the uh, library guy, um, the equity, diversity and inclusion library guy. And I highly recommend you to go and check out the, the guy. It's super helpful. Um, and uh, one particular thing is the the lack of privilege walk. Um, so this link to the library guy, I will put it in the chat for you. I mean, I will put it in the follow-up email for you, uh, for you to go and explore. So uh, our social identity can inform and influence the way we see the world, the way we understand approach, in this case, teach and learn, right? So these social identities sometimes intersect and that's when we have intersectionality. Um, how different aspects of the identity intersect and the effect um, of one experience of privilege or lack of can be compounding depend on their intersectionality. So I give you an example here. Uh, why only 21% of corporate leader in the US are women, um, four of corporate leader are women of color, and particularly only 1% of black women. So the vast underrepresentation of black women in leadership position in the business in corporate um, uh, can be attributed to the, the disadvantage created by the intersection of race and gender. Um, instead of the effect of race or gender alone. So um, it's appear that intersectionality have a compounding effect on women of color um, in corporate leadership in the US in this very particular case, right? So we just, we talk about identity, social identity and how those grant or limit your privilege. And then sometime when the different social identity intersect, it makes the effect, whether it's positive or negative, compounding, right? So I want to pause here for just a minute and ask the question, does intersectionality affect higher education? Do you experience it? Um, and if you have not experienced it, have you seen it mass manifesting in your classroom? And will you be willing to share with the group your thought on intersectionality in your classroom? Anyone? I will I'll elaborate just a little bit based on my experience. This is Tracy. Mm -hmm. I have a short lived experience with intersexuality um, from in and outside of the classroom, not here at NIU, but at other institutions. Not my personal experience, but experiences of students in the classroom. And just mm -hmm. to elaborate just a little bit, oftentimes students, because I worked in at the community college level and the higher education university level. And oftentimes students who transition from the community college to an institution of higher education, if they're not afforded the skill sets and the, the credentialing that they need to succeed, oftentimes they feel as if they're not equipped to succeed successfully. So my role over the years was to bridge the connection between the ability to be successful at both the two and four-year institutions. So that's been my experience. I see. 
Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that with the group. It's it can manifest in many different ways too, particularly um in higher education, something that I observe is gender and leadership. So if you look at um high level administrator position in in higher education, it's still um somewhat dominant by men instead of women. Um so that's something to, to to, to consider as we move forward. So that was the intro to um, Im imposter syndrome. So this is what you are here for, right? So the term imposter syndrome or imposter phenomenon were first introduced in 1978 in a study by Clans and Imes. And this study identified the imposter phenomenon or imposter syndrome among high achieving professional. So, very important to point out, high-achieving professional, middle to upper-class white woman. So despite outstanding academic and professional accomplishment, these women experience the imposter phenomenon persists in believing that they are not really that bright and have fooled anyone who thinks otherwise. And somehow they are afraid of being discovered. Now, I want to point out that this original study that defined imposter phenomenon for the, the rest of us um, is uh, it did not adequately capture the experiences of racial and ethical diverse groups. And so the current conceptualization of imposter syndrome failed to consider the unique dynamics such as racism, perceived discrimination, and marginalization marginalization. Um, all of this are significant predictor of imposter phenomenon among these population, right? So this is my challenge to the psychology in the field and uh, for you to consider too that there is a need for more inclusive research that consider the unique experiences of racial and ethical minority individual in relation to the imposter phenomenon. Um, especially as NIU become a minority majority institution, this need become more critical, right? So the imposter phenomenon um, originally thought to be prevalent among women because the study was done on women, uh, but it's it turned out that um, there are more study after that original study and um, more recent study have shown that the feeling of inadequacy exists among both men and women and in many walks of life. Uh, there's a consensus that the impulsive feeling is especially prevalent among people working in the field where the gender or race make them an obvious minority. So naturally, things get worse when we consider the intersectionality that we should talk about. So the intersection of multiple marginalized identity that some of us carry can make the experience of imposter syndrome um, have a compounding negative effect. So the imposter feeling can be caused by a number of factors, including but not limited to these factors, but it could be from stereotypes, discrimination, microaggression, lack of role model, lack of inclusive, equitable mentorship, lack of opportunities, especially opportunity for, for leadership. Um, and I'm speaking from my own experience. So how did my intersectionality show up for me as a woman of color, first generation graduate from college, first generation immigrant uh, with no money, no connection. Um, it was very challenging for me to navigate the higher education system in the United States. Um, so I faced all, all the stereotype, discrimination, microaggression. I didn't even have the language development to name them until 20 years later. Now, as a professional developer, I finally have the language to call out, um, to name the experiences that I have. Um, so um, there's, as a non-native English speaker, there was countless situation where I was made to feel like unintelligent um, just because I didn't have the language development to express my thought and feeling uh, quickly. Um, so now, but I don't want to 
let all of that affect me in a negative way. So I I try really hard, work hard. I earn an as associate degree, bachelor, master, and finally a PhD. And also I'm an award winning educator um, here at NIU. Despite all of that, um, those are my earns earn social identity. I still sometimes feel like I don't belong in higher education. And I feel that way because society has sized me with identity associated with fewer capability and fewer privilege. Um, so yeah, I say it out there. I often suffer from imposter syndrome. And that's why this subject is very personal for me. Um, but the way I deal with it is I carry a healthy dose of self-doubt and imposter feeling into the classroom, but then I turn them into a self-coach, a motivational motivational coach and leverage them to make me a better human and a better instructor in a classroom. So I'm going to give you a few examples of how stereotype and microaggression can show up in your classroom on college campuses. So um, if you remember way back, right, um, when higher education were forming, traditionally women were excluded from higher education. Now today women have elbowed ourselves into higher education and in many fields have become the dominant. Um, so like in social sciences, in liberal arts, especially in early childhood education, um, suddenly male students in the field become the underrepresented minority. So an example of the underrepresented minority is a male student in early childhood education. Um, we desperately need more male child care provider as well as male elementary teacher. Um, and uh, we all have implicit bias. Um, those are the automatic unconscious classification formed by societal stereotype uh, about others based on identity characteristic like race, gender, socioeconomic status. Um, and an example of implicit bias is um, having low academic expectation for multilingual learner or English as a second language learner and student of color. So sometimes when not being called out or addressed, implicit bias can grow into microaggression and we don't want that. So we want to address this um, as they show up in your classroom. Um, an example of microaggression is assigning intelligence to a student based on their race. And, and then questioning their competence if it doesn't agree with our own assumption. Um, so we need to understand how harmful stereotypes and behavior can create imposter syndrome. Um, I'm gonna stop here. I know this is a heavy subject. So I wanna see if there are any thought, question, challenge. I welcome, um, your thought, your feedback, including opposing or pushback opinion. This is a very engaging conversation, Lynn. And I just recall when you made reference to like the marginalized groups, inclusive learning, socioeconomic status and students of color. Going yeah. back to my experience at the community college level, that's the cohort of students that I was actually assigned. And this mm -hmm. particular cohort of students were students of color who happened to be single parents. I see. And they experience a lot of the, the microaggression that you were referring to, like lack of the ability to understand that they're able to transcend their social status. Mm -hmm. And the way that I was able to bridge the gap is just, as you mentioned, putting the language down, familiarizing them with different resources that's on campus so that they're aware that we were in support of their needs. So the fact that you're bringing this to the forefront today is very forward thinking and I appreciate the fact that you put this presentation together. I appreciate your feedback. Thank you so much. Um, so I present this presentation once before and I did receive some really um, intelligent and challenging pushback and um, that's why I, I welcome it here. So there were one participant asked whether 
um, it, she pushed back and say that um, whether the imposter feeling have anything to do with um, personality or, or character straight, right? And so I, I appreciate that pushback and feedback. So I went and dig deeper into the empirical research. And I found a few studies that show a negative correlation between characters straight like self-esteem and imposter phenomenal. So basically there were one study that I found that that were able to make the connection of people with low self-esteem to have higher uh, imposter phenomenal experience. But then at the same time, I, I realized that the cultural or specific context were not considered in these study, in these few study. So we want to make an argument that um, that one of the implication of the impulsive feeling is that they actually reduce self-esteem. And when you constantly view a less capable because of things you cannot change, like being a woman in the STEM field or, or your skin tone or your accent, or or where you were born on earth. Um, just those random things that, that make you view a less capable can actually have a negative impact on your self-esteem. And that's why it make you feel the imposter syndrome. So um, the original study that defined imposter phenomenon did not adequately capture the experiences of, of racially and ethically diverse group. And so I challenge people in that field to do more research, more diverse, inclusive research that consider um, the unique experiences of racially and ethically minority individual. And um, it's it show up differently in different campus because right now for NIU, 70% of our students are students of color. So now on NIU campus, being white is being a minority. So it doesn't matter what group being the minority, but when they are the obvious minority, we have to take care of them. Um, all right, so um, so that was the, the conceptualization of imposter syndrome. So now what are the strategy for us as educator, instructor, professor, how do we destigmatize impulsive feeling, right? So the first thing is to um, acknowledge, acknowledge that it's normal, it exists and build awareness. So um, thank you so much for being here for this workshop. Uh, whether you professor, support the staff or educator in general, um, we should normalize it, acknowledge it, educate ourselves about the imposter phenomenon and its manifestation in diverse population. So I think increased awareness can help all of us recognize that um, the imposter feeling in our student and understand its implication for mental health, including anxiety, depression, reduced self-esteem, um, that's precisely why we offer this workshop and that's why I'm really happy and I want to applaud you all for making it a priority to be here today. Um, another thing we could do is to create a supportive environment. Um, professional can work to create supportive environment that validate the experiences of minoritized students. And once again, minoritized student can be that male student in the early childhood development field. Um, so when we create supportive environment, this include fostering open discussion about race, identity, and the pressure that contribute to the feeling of inadequacy, um, which can help students feel understood and supported. Last thing is embracing a growth mindset. And I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes talking about this in, at length. I want to talk about how the way we view mistake um, can have, uh, com have a very profound impact on learning. So if we view mis mistake as a part of learning, um, uh, then then we embrace a grown mindset. Is it really a mistake or is it a lesson learned, right? So um, 
discuss um, how mistake as part of learning. Um, I'm gonna put three questions here for you. We're gonna take a few minutes to read this and you can pick and choose. I haven't heard from Catherine and Kay. So um, the three questions you see here, one is you share a personal experience when you make a mistake. And then ultimately that led to significant learning or growth. Uh, if you have a story, uh, an experience you would like to share, we would love to hear that. Um, or you could pick the second question. So what are some strategy or practices that you use throughout your um, undergraduate, graduate career and in your life that help you effect effectively learn from your mistake? And the third question, and you can pick any of the three, um, how can you create a culture that encourages open discussion and learning from mistake in your class? Um, I, I can pick number yeah. three. Yeah, Catherine, go for it. Yeah, I uh, encourage students to resubmit assignments, uh, especially formative assignments. If they aren't happy with their first grade, I give them feedback. And then, you know, if there is a mistake or, um, you know, maybe they didn't put that effort into it, then they can learn and grow from it. Wonderful. That is absolutely great. Are you the art education discipline? Are you yes. in art education? Okay. So yeah. I work with um, pre-service educators and I also work with K through six elementary teachers at NIU doing their art methods class. So they might not have a background in art. Yeah, so you allow them multiple opportunities to submit their work for feedback and then resubmit. Is that what you said? Correct, thank you. Yeah, yeah. that's that's is a great example of uh, the, some strategy that you can embrace and teach students that mistake as opportunity to grow and to learn. Hi. Um, Hi, I am, I wanna take number two, some of the strategies or mistakes that help you okay. effectively learn from your mistakes. Um, it takes a lot of self-awareness actually to acknowledge that you did something. <laughs> Um, bad or it was incorrect or such as a mistake but I think over the years the one effective way for me to learn or effectively learn from these mistakes is to open up to people that I trust a really mm -hmm. good support group uh, I think they really played they have been playing a crucial role for me to process what happened what I did and they give me sound pieces of advice that helped me to like move forward and hope and pray that I will not do the same mistakes. But I know that if I if I do get things incorrectly or if I do things like I still do the I still like do things like not in a good way. I have the support group who will lead me to uh, effectively learning from what I did. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. So, um, so it's in a way you get feedback too, right? So when you think you did something that's not optimal or something that, that's maybe a mistake, then you go to your trust, this uh, group of mentor or friends or your social support, and then you get feedback from them. So that's great, yeah. Um. So those are all great. Tracy, do you have anything to share or add? Oh, sure. I actually can speak from a student support perspective. I'll take number three, how can you create a culture mm -hmm. that encourages open discussion and learning from mistakes in the classroom? Removing the classroom component more so from a student support perspective, going back to my experience at the community college level, the cohort of students, as I mentioned, they were students who were considered the marginalized student population. So being new to the role, what I did as a way to obtain their buy-in is I took a survey. And this particular survey identified key indicators that students needed in order to succeed. And with that survey, what I did is I formed a focus group 
and it was almost like a panel discussion and I brought administrators, faculty and staff in so the students were able to identify themselves outside of the role as being a student, coupled with the fact you were able to identify different resources and student support services that that said institution has. So that's the angle that I took from a student support perspective. Yeah, thank you so much, Tracy, for sharing that. So all the things that you guys share here um, are some of the things that I'm going to summarize later. They all great strategy to help your student learn from their mistake. Um, so I taught chemistry and in my class, I work really hard to normalize being wrong or making a mistake in chemistry. Um, and I keep telling them that it's okay to make mistake. It's normal to make mistake. That's how we learn. Um, so I try to set the tone for my classroom where I encourage students to participate and we kind of do a little celebration when somebody shouted out something wrong. I would say that excellent. We actually going to learn something new today because if you already know the answer to it, then you probably shouldn't be here. You should be in upper division chemistry classes. So, um, so I also did something similar to Catherine in the homework system. I allow my student to basically have unlimited attempt on their homework, particularly the one that required them to do a quantitative calculation um, so that they can correct their initial uh, responses that a lot of the time was not correct and then learn from that mistake. So those are all great strategy. Um, so. Um, we here is uh, where we I want us to discuss about how we we can view mistake. It can be both view are harmful or helpful, depend on the mindset, right? So my high school physics teacher told me that it would be wise for me to pursue something like biology instead of physics uh, because he didn't think I was good enough for physics. And then my chemistry teacher also thought that I didn't have what it took to be a be good at chemistry. Um, so guess what I did? I end up with a PhD in physical chemistry, like combine both of it to prove to both my physics high school teacher and my chemistry high school teacher that I was wrong. Um, that's the kind of student that I was. Um, so I I also have student, in, I mean, I have professor in my undergraduate year, chemistry professor, who say things like, look to your left, look to your right, only half of you are going to make it in this class. And so, and they was like, if you can't pass my class, you probably should consider changing major. So these, uh, 20 years ago, when I were on um, college campus, were normal. It's very normal in the, the chemistry field to have this kind of deficit mindset. Now, the it, these kind of messages is send a fixed mindset or a deficit mindset that you don't have what it take or you don't belong here, right? So research have shown that students who see their instructor endorses this kind of belief um, that only some students have it and some students don't. Um, when they find themselves making mistake in a the class, they can often feel at those they are an imposter in that classroom. And that can really set them back in terms of seeking help asking questions, finding a study group to work with, and all of the things that we know actually contribute to student success, right? So uh, I don't know how you learn, but I don't get things effortlessly, perfectly, and immediately. I need repetition, practice, testing, failing, learning. Um, I need to review, reflect, get feedback, rethink, and ultimately learn something. Um, so I make it very clear to my student that this is the way most humans learn. We have ample research to back that up. So um, I think what I'm trying to say here is as a Husky community of scholars and learner, do we want to have a mindset culture where we believe as a group that intelligence, skill, and ability are fixed? You either have them or you don't, or do we think that it's possible to grow, to develop and learn new skill, develop intelligent ability and other aspects of ourselves? 
So um, how can we help our students fail productively, right? So this is one way we can identify opportunity that come out of mistake. So when you're leading a new and uncharted territory, like etching, leading edge of, of research in your field, um, consider reframing failures as important discovery. So these intelligent failure let you know what didn't work so you can quickly rethink and try a different approach. Um, in teaching, um, complex and major mistakes often happen because the smaller mistake, um, complex and major mistake often happen when the smaller mistakes are not caught and corrected. So how can we help students make small mistakes so they don't make big and catastrophic mistakes, right? So like in the chemistry class, I would um, try to let my student uh, work on multiple step um, problem in when they do their homework. So I try to catch the small mistake that I make when they do their homework so that for the exam, because I have a large enrollment class, so all my exam were multiple choice and I cannot see the step-by-step -step the student do. So um, if I train them how to do the multiple step problem in their homework and catch the small mistake, then they less likely to make a bigger mistake and select the wrong answer on the exam on the multiple choice exam um, and then in general in 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 real life um, like Catherine mentioned multiple draft review revision multiple attempt on homework and quizzes um, and and um, if you could give them immediate feedback after they submit their homework. Um, so they have the option to make correction, have another attempt on similar problem, and, and then only record maybe the highest scoring attempt um, to promote growth mindset and embracing learning uh, and growth. Um, in general and in real life, how can we set up to catch and correct mistakes be before they can cause harm, right? So um, for seeing like a checklist, I have checklists all the time, it can present basic mistake. Um, <clears throat> however, we do need to go through checklists uh, very mindfully. Um, another thing is to avoid a culture of zero tolerance for mistake or failure. When we create a culture that doesn't tolerate mistake, mistakes still happen because we still human. Um, it's just we don't hear about them. And so there's no opportunity to learn and no opportunity for improve, uh, improving and, and it can potentially presenting a more complex mistake. Um, from happening. So um, some other strategies to turn the imposter feeling into productivity, um, a lot of it depends, like I say, the way we view mistake and failure. is often affects student learning and growth. Students perceive that their professor endorses a fixed mindset um, and, and feel like an imposter, like they don't belong in that classroom. Um, this affects students who do well and as affect the students who don't. Um, so with that said, imposter syndrome is a shared experience. It's very real and common, um, particularly among people working in a field where the gender, race, income level, ethnic city, um, et cetera, make them the obvious minority. So finding a support system is very important and, and key, right? Um, so surround yourself with people who believe in you and your ability, like friend, family, or mentor, like Kay mentioned. Um, and then um, setting realistic goal for your student and then help them setting a uh, goal for themselves. So these are realistic, achievable goal um, that you can help them eventually achieve the learning outcome for your course. And I mentioned the 
uh, support system and counseling. I mean, if that's what it takes, uh, we do offer counseling here for students. They have the op option to seek counseling. Um, and I usually try to get the link to the different students support services um, onto my Blackboard course so that students can access them. And I mention it, I normal like it. It's very normal to seek help. And uh, when we mention it, um, we encourage students um, to use it if they need to. Uh, another thing is celebrate um, their accomplishment and celebrate your accomplishment. Appreciate small successes to build up confidence, right? Enjoying small successes and celebrate your achievement builds confidence and develop a more positive outlook. And um, you can model behavior for them, practicing self-compassion, um, challenging negative thoughts. So um, I suffer from this uh, impulsive feeling. So when I have a negative thought, I usually train myself to take a step back, question those thoughts, challenge them. Are they true? Is there any evidence to support these negative feelings? And if there isn't, then um, it's essential to challenge and replace them with more positive thoughts. And so um, when you do this, um, you can help your student if they trust you enough to share with you and you can help them develop a more positive outlook and help boost their, their confidence by pointing and celebrating the accomplishment that they've done. Um, the last thing, activism, is actually there were a research that I found where students who suffer uh, from impulsive feeling, like less, they feel like they less capable or they were made to believe that they less, um, they actually channel that and become an advocate, advocating for themselves, advocating for other by engaging in activism um, to empower themselves and empower other who feel marginalized or discriminated against. So they actually turn their impulsive feeling into activism and it helped them with their mental health. So, um, So um, there's, there's, these are a few of the strategy that we could use to help first normalize impulsive feeling and then help them turn those feelings um, into a motivation, a self-coach that can encourage them to do more and achieve more. Um, I'm going to stop here and see... Is there anything that you would like to add or remove? All right, I have a reflection slide so we can move on. <clears throat> so in this, since there are only the four of us here, I'm going to invite you to write down a few things that you've done that you are proud of. And we can do this in the chat. So why don't you take the next minute or two, think about, it doesn't have to be a big thing. Like, do, have you done something today that you feel good about? You took a walk in the morning or um, have you done something this week that you are proud of? celebrate small successes and small accomplishment. And when you're ready, you can type that in the chat. Kylie, are these personal or professional successes that you're referring to? I, Tracy, that's a great question. I don't think it have to be professional. I mean, we all human. Um, one of the things that I try to do in my classroom is to to present myself and bring my whole self into the classroom as a human and not just their professor. Um, so yeah, I think it doesn't have to be professional. Um. 
poster or something that really quick. Sure. I recall teaching a career preparation course, and this course was geared towards undergraduate students who were near degree completion and they needed the skill sets to interview correctly, cover letter, resume, and mock interviewing. And what I did is I did automate the class towards the end so that they were able to use a platform that allowed them to listen to themselves as they were interviewing, mock interviewing, and then as opposed to me just writing the cover letter and resume. And doing the edits, I actually showed them how they're able to improve their resumes moving forward. So that's just something I was proud of because they have that resume going forward. And yeah, up. that's amazing. <clears throat> um, Kay say work out this morning and able to add more data for the paper and writings. That's perfect. Um, congratulations. I need to... I, I'm getting over something. I need to get better so I can go back to the gym. Um, Catherine, I finished last week grade. Yes, with individual eye feedback for two classes. Congratulations. Um, yeah, grading can be very challenging. Uh, that's the one thing that I don't miss about teaching. <laughs> I love teaching, but grading can be um, challenging. So thank you for sharing. Also, I don't know if Catherine and Kay, do you know that um, NIU is now Adobe Creative Campus? That means you should have an account with Adobe Creative um, if you use your NIU credential. So you can go in there and play with the different creative tool. I make this image. Um, it's a, uh, I make it with Adobe Express text to image AI. And I, it's really fun to play with it. So yeah, check, go check it out if you haven't done that. <clears throat> so the last thing I have here for reflection, um, I'm glad that Tracy asked the question about professional or personal. Um, to me, um, embracing my identity is very important. And I think that in the classroom, um, I hope and I inspire um, and encourage faculty to show some of their other identity other than being the professor. Um, so that's why I start this presentation with the definition on identities and how some identity grant privilege and some identity limited privilege. So how do these identity inform the way you see the world, the way you see yourself? And um, a lot of the time is informed the way you feel, whether you feel belong, whether you feel like you're an imposter, or like me, sometimes I feel like in certain situation, I will constantly to make to feel less capable. It does some damage on my um, self-esteem for sure. So I want you to reflect on these. <clears throat> and then I'm going to challenge you to I'm sorry, I'm having a cough. Anyway, uh, I'm sorry. Um, I challenge you to think about the way you could create a culture that encourage open discussion and learn from mistake in your class and I really think it's going to help your student with their impulsive feeling their mental health and their learning as well and um <clears throat> Yeah, thank you, and I'm sorry, bearing with me. This is my contact information. I will send a follow-up email with the slide, 
and all the resources that I uh, compile from reading. So I will share these resources with you. And um, thank you so much for being here with me. And thank you for working with me through my um, <laughs> recovering from a sickness. And have a great day. You're welcome. Thank you.